I ask you, where's the money? And where's the money for the women? I asked that last week in a conference in Atlantic City, a uh, week before that in Florida, a wonderful conference called, a funny name, Benzinga, and yesterday an all-women's conference. Where is the money? That's what we're gonna talk about today. I am Jean Sullivan. I am a longtime venture capitalist. And uh, 10 years ago, I left my fund and I got into the cannabis business, which has been a wild ride, <laughs> a crazy wild. And I will tell you a little secret, even though there are some men in our audience, and thank you for being here, I really only care about helping the women. That's what I do. And here's what's amazing. So do these three women who are extraordinary thought leaders and making a difference for finding that capital, investing, supporting people, and more. Is that cool? So that's what we're talking about today. So let's start, even though Anne introduced you briefly. Uh, yes. Uh, let's just go down the line and give the audience a little bit more about who you are. Victoria, you start. Okay, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am uh, Chief Investment Officer at Astia and a managing partner of our venture fund. Um, Astia has been around for over 25 years. It began as an accelerator or an incubator. It evolved into an accelerator and then into an investment house, always with the mission of leveling the investment playing field for women entrepreneurs and their teams. Um, in the high growth space. Um, we've been lucky to have Jean Sullivan as a longtime board member, and we miss you every day, Since Jean. Since about 1900, I've been <laughs> on that board. But that's because I care so much. They have, how many rounds of financing have you done for women? Oh. Over 100 and some odd. Yeah, I, I think it's about 140 now that's rounds amazing. of financing. Um, th we're currently investing out of our venture fund. It focuses on um, companies at the Series A and B stages, uh, led by women in all sectors, so across sectors, but all high growth. Um, and what else should I say about myself? I've been with Astia since 2013. I have an entrepreneurial background myself, so I think what I love most is really being able to post-investment work with the entrepreneurs. Um, I, I'm sure some of you are entrepreneurs in the audience. It's a, a lonely, hard road, and so being able to really be a sounding board and, and help them be successful. Um, it doesn't get any easier after you get the funding. And, and the next round of funding is just as hard, unfortunately, for women. So um, really being that support and opening doors. Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Weiss. It's so nice to be here. Jean, thank you so much. So I'm the founder of Women Funding the World. And you know we don't need another gathering of investors necessarily. But what I saw was that angels stay with angels, private equity with a private equity hedge with hedge, and philanthropists stay separate. And so I wanted to bring us together to go deeper and talk about capital in a feminized way. So what does the feminization of capital look, look like? It looks like, like we are protectors of living systems, right? And so the flow of capital matters. And someone, I recently, someone here said, money loves speed. Well, in living systems, we flow in the way nature flows. We flow in a way that's nurturing to all. So it's not necessarily the, the, the next dimension of capital is not the masculinized model of profits and shareholders above all else. It's a circular kind of an, a, a movement of capital. And so when capital sits at 3% or less, um, there is a imbalance in the health of that financial system. So one, Women Funding the World is coming together, and then the Diversified Capital Coalition is a nonprofit. We're writing a white paper right now on how to turn that under 3% of capital to 10% in 10 years by inspiring and showcasing the great men that are already doing this and really working with unconscious and conscious bias of those pension funds, private equity funds, hedge, you know, hedge funds, venture funds, et cetera, that are, they're, they're, they're really well-meaning, but they just don't have the tools. And so that's what we're going to bring to them. So get that money out of those men, right? <laughs> now, Jody, uh, one more thing. People don't know your amazing background. Tell people a little bit about your great uh, okay. pedigree and professional life. In my early career, I was a sports agent at IMG. 
And I worked with Jackie Joyner and Flojo and represented Ben Johnson, Zola Bud, Mary Decker. So we did licensing deals, book deals, TV deals, uh, et cetera. I was a Jody McGuire. In my middle career, I launched a beauty brand modeled after Paul Newman by the name of Peacekeeper Cosmetics. And we funded uh, ingredients from women who had been trafficked, indentured, who just lived at the very base of the uh, economic uh, framework. And we gave them a second source of income. And so Peacekeeper was an enterprise philanthropic company. Very cool. Angela, tell people about you, what you're building, your yeah. life. Um, thank you, Jean. So uh, my day job is a professor at Columbia Business School, where I mostly teach venture capital, and I'm the faculty director of our entrepreneurship center. And then 37 Angels has been a passion project for the last 11 years. Um, and I really started it with two goals in mind. The first is to shine a, a light on the black box that is startup investing. And I'm actually focused um, on the female investor, so trying to educate more women on how to be angel investors, how to be venture capitalists, because we need more women writing checks so that more women um, receive those checks. Um, and so we've been doing that. And uh, at this point, we've looked at 20,000 startups and invested in over 100. And um, people always ask me, why is it called 37 Angels? We have well over 100 angels at this, uh, well over 37 angels at this point. Uh, when we started, only 13% of angel investors were women, and we wanted to close the gap from 13% to 50%. The great news is that 11 years later, we've gone from 13% to about a third, depending on how you track the numbers. So we have made great strides, um, and so it's really great to see that, and I am optimistic about the future. Yes, because a lot of women now have become those angels, right? And that's been one of the secrets. Did you pick that up? Women, funding women, that's one of the issues. Victoria, to you. Well, I, was, oh, I just want to say, I encourage anybody who's involved in philanthropy, become a 37 angel. It's, it's, it's a different way of putting your money to work, but your program is amazing. And I, I've talked to people who've gone through Angela's program, and it gets you comfortable with investing, startups, and on that whole world. And then you're, then you're out there, and you're doing it. So two things to tell you. You know, you... You in the audience, this wonderful audience, Cheryl, thank you for pulling us all together again. Uh, may not be building a business or looking for financing, but I'll bet your daughter, your niece, your aunt, your friend is. So take this in for them because we have these pearls of wisdom. I love saying, because I'm laughingly telling you that I, I think I'm on my victory lap here, that, uh, that if I don't share our wisdom, our insights, our screw-ups, our successes, guess what? It's all going to go away. So take it in because we are so active in this and care so much. And so that's, that's something I, I just wanted to share. And the other thing is, guess what? The reason why it's so hard for women, that's been figured out. The research has been done. Now, are the solutions in place? No, I know that's what the four of us entirely work on. But we do know why, so that's some of the things we're going to talk about. Victoria, to you, uh, ASIA really makes a business in figuring out the research. Talk to us about some of that. Sure. Um, so to start with the numbers, um, I still hear the two percent numbers. Maybe it's gone up to three, but most of the research has been pretty. It's been pretty solid for since really 1999. Is that less than two percent of venture capital goes to women CEO founded companies? Um, if you look at male-female teams, it, depending on what data you look at, it's anywhere between 8%. And I recently saw maybe up to 17%. I think that came out on PitchBook the other day. But think about it. That means that 83 to 92% of all venture capital is going to all male teams. Yeah, guess what? I Let looked that it sink up. in. 170.6 billion is that number of 2023. Yeah. Keep going. And then, of course, if you layer in race, it's far, far worse. 0.35% of venture capital goes to black women CEOs. So these are dismal, dismal numbers. Um, on the flip side, there's plenty of research that shows that inclusive teams outperform. And in fact, there was just a study, uh, or just some research that came out, it was published on TechCrunch, where they did a study of the phenotype of unicorn founders, so unicorns are companies that have made it to a, a billion dollars in valuation or more, and they found that 70% of those founders were what they call underdogs, and they define that as either immigrants, 
women or people of color. It's pretty cool. Um, but the problem is that the data doesn't change behaviors. So, um, Gene, you ask why. I think there are many, many reasons, and you all have uh, your you know, reasons you can add as well. But a couple, I'll throw out a couple things. Number one, um, money still moves across networks, right? And networks still divide, primarily along gender and race. And so, you know, traditionally in VC, deals are sourced from within networks. So, number one, there's a network effect. Um, there's some great research out of Harvard about how uh, male entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs are asked different questions. And it doesn't matter who the asker is. Asker could be male or female, but men tend to be asked promotional questions, which allow them to talk about the size of the market and the, vi the big vision, whereas women are asked questions that put them on the defense, like, you know, how are you going to mitigate risk? What happens if you don't hit your sales projections? And then when those two transcripts are looked at, well, who gets, the, without knowing the gender, who gets the funding? The person who answered all the, promo the promotional questions. So there's question bias. Of course, there's pattern recognition. There's looking for the phenotype of the entrepreneur. And that's why I love that study that was published on TechCrunch, because everyone thinks that the successful entrepreneur is a young white guy in a hoodie. You know, so there's that pattern recognition and, and all of that that happens. Um, so for all of those reasons, I mean, there are so many more. I don't know. Does, do you want to jump in on any other yeah, reasons add why? In, add in, as well as some of the solutions that we know could maybe fix this. But help yourself. So I'll, uh, just speaking of like that archetype, um, how old do you think the oh, average VC back founder is? Age. 35? Other numbers? 38. I, I think that there is this, like, people think that it should be young. Um, I, I think I hear that sometimes. And the average VC back, the average founder, I think, is 42. The average VC back founder is 44. The average successful back VC founder is 47. And I share that because people have this, we, we keep people to talk about, like, pattern matching and, and all this. It's wrong, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and so I, I think it is um, interesting how people, when faced with this data, they're not, um, they, their minds aren't necessarily uh, converted. So one thing I will say about um, solutions, um, so I think um, two things. The first thing is for all of you, I would really encourage you to lean into the imposter syndrome. I think that people treat the imposter syndrome as, as if it's a bad thing. I think it's a fantastic thing. I think if you are like, I am crushing it at work, I totally get everything that I'm doing, go do something else. So I think the imposter syndrome is where we're learning. And the reason why that's so important is that women face way more of it. And um, I'm assuming a lot of you have read the research that says that women only apply to jobs when they're 100% qualified for all the job qualifications, while as men will apply when they're about 60% qualified. Well, guess what? If all that. of us, if that, I know. <laughs> um, all, uh, all of us are underqualified to invest in startups. We're all underqualified to be entrepreneurs, because by definition, these are, you know, uh, like really visionary ideas in nascent industries. And so all of us are wildly uh, uh, unqualified. But by leaning into that and being like, okay, maybe I feel a little bit uncomfortable, but saying I'm going to try anyway, I think is really, um, really, really important. And um, you know, I, I hear this all the time from women investors. They're like, oh, you know, I've written seven checks, I've been an angel investing for a couple of years, but I, I'm not really an angel investor. And guys will write one wow. check seven years ago, and they're like, I am a <laughs> VC investor, you know. And, and so like, lean That's into so that true. and own those labels. It's so true. Love it. Love it. So true. I, so I was with a banker <coughs> the other day, and he told me about a study at Rutgers, and they have a question. It's a, not too hard of a question. Most people can answer it. And they were offering $3 up to $10 to, if you got the question right. So the guys answered the question, was off, were offered $3, and they go, yo, where's my $10, right? The women answered the question, got it right, were offered $3 and left the room. Right, and so it's just such a, um, a metaphor what we're dealing with, like to, st to lean in, to stand up for our value, and to be super confident with our numbers and what we're offering in the world, and to have a great team around us, and, and that's what they invest in, that's, what they, they, that's the starting point. So if you're a woman and you have that, everything, it still ends up being under 3%. And so I think one of the, the, the issues that we're doing, what is unconscious bias or conscious bias? You know, there's been all this whole 
understanding that well, I invest in people that look like me or we went to the same school, I feel safe, I feel comfortable. And we're making money, like we're making money. But what I want to explore with, with guys, 73% um, of venture is from, um, funded by or controlled by guys from Harvard and uh, Harvard and Stanford. And so I want to explore what it would feel like if they were in our position because there's a type of, um, it's just a, a quality that's not very healthy, I would say. And, um, and also unconscious bias is, is a framework like nature itself where, where it's unhealthy for the financial system itself to thrive. So when you have a financial system that's squeezed down and much of the population in finance are overlooked, it's, it's systematic, it's a systemic illness, it's a systemic dysfunction. And so we wanna talk to them and invite them in to help us solve this problem together. Because they're just doing, they're just doing their comfortable thing, that's what they're doing, and it's not a criticism of them, but the times are changing. And um, that's why I love concepts around living systems because finance is also a living system. It's always been our uh, philosophy in line with that at Astia. To, to, in order to make the change, we always want to do everything kind of half men, half women. So our network is very purposefully not a women's network. It's very much about half men, half women. Our board of directors, you know, we always made sure we have half men, half women. Um, and we have a, a few token men on our team as well. Uh, and they'll say, they, they joke about that. They're like, I'm the token man. But, you know, we need that. We need that voice and we actually appreciate it. But we need men at the table to make a difference. And for, you know, you're asking about solutions. At Astia, we believe, number one, you have to be really intentional because all these reasons that we've said that women don't get funded, like we've said, the data that shows that inclusive teams outperform doesn't counter those biases, right? Just because you know the numbers doesn't mean you're going to have a different reaction or behavior. So you have to be super, super intentional. So you know, at Astia, number one, we're, we require the teams to be inclusive. Uh, it doesn't have to be a woman CEO, but it has to be a woman at that C-level founding position, leadership. Um, and then as we screen companies, we very methodically have a system that removes bias. And it's everything from avoiding groupthink. Um, we do things like have cameras off during the, the Zoom meeting pitch. We have the same questions. You know, we do these things that counter all of those biases I talked about so that at least for our screening process, what comes out at the end is a very diverse group of, of successful companies. And then, then we can go into due diligence and make our decisions. But a long time ago, Astia realized that how do you change things? Well, you, you just, you invest. Stop talking about it, stop writing about it. I mean, yes, it's good to do those things. But the writing about it and the talking about it and the all of that doesn't do it. You've got to just go invest. And that's when Astia started investing in 2013. So I encourage everyone in this room, sign up for 37 Angels <laughs> and invest. Or, <clears throat> or, or just you know, ha get other people to invest. But that's the only way we're going to make the difference is just to go out and do it. I love it. And something I noticed, you know, we, you mentioned phil uh, philanthropic uh, efforts earlier. And I believe in that. And all of us have given, you know, till it hurts. But you know what? So many women, especially, uh, easily write, let's say, a $10,000 check to United Fund. But when it comes to their friend giving them 10000 to start their business, oh, well, what if that doesn't make it? Well, you think you're going to get any money back from the <laughs> philanthropy, you know? So that needs to be pointed out. Uh, back to you, Angela. Tell us more. I love your line. Uh, lessons learned from looking at uh, 20,000 different uh, deals. Tell us some of your lessons learned. I've heard you do a keynote on it. It's funny and great. But give us some snippets from that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, investing, uh, I like alliteration, so we follow the 4P framework of when you're investing in a startup, you want to look at people, problem, progress, and price. People obviously being the team. We similarly care about diversity on the team of all sorts, right? So that could be gender diversity, it could be age diversity, it could be background diversity. Um, I remember one time uh, this startup pitched us 
and it was uh, three guys who all went to Duke, all played lacrosse, all were lawyers, and when, when they pitched us, two of them were wearing the same Brooks Brothers shirt. <laughs> I'm like, I, I don't need that, I don't know that I need all three of you on this founding team, we probably need one of you, and then two people with different backgrounds, right? So diversity of all sorts. On the problem side, large problem. Um, so really solving a big problem. And this is something that I do see over and over again with female founders, is they will often be a little bit more conservative in their estimates. And at the end of the day, VCs and angels, we need really big outcomes um, to invest. Um, and so when I do founder coaching, I do say like present that best case scenario. I think it's really important to do. Um, on the progress side, of course, um, having some traction and then price, deal terms need to be fair. And again, we have very clear data, both broadly, but also from within our own um, pipeline. Women ask for less funding, and they ask for funding at lower valuations, which means that it's much harder for them to get to their Series A and their Series B and Series C. And as bad as the numbers are, if you look at later stage funding, it, like the bar chart, you can no longer see the bar, because so little money goes to female founders at later stages. Um, so those are some things that we talk about. And it's interesting, you know, as an investor, I spent a lot of time negotiating with founders to increase their valuations. And it almost always, nine times out of 10, is an underrepresented founder in some way, shape, or form. I just had a conversation yesterday. I was like, you cannot raise at a $4 million valuation. I would say raise it a five minimally, because otherwise you're gonna give away too much of your company. Um, so those are some of the things that we look at. And um, again, I have a lot of these conversations um, on a daily basis. And just to add to that, the thing that we see in the boardroom a lot once we've invested is that the women CEOs and especially the women of color CEOs have underpaid themselves and maybe even don't have enough equity in their company. And so often that's the first thing we go in to fix is we need to raise their salary, then we do market comps, and then we need to, you know, increase, we need to increase their options so that they have more ownership that, that sh is where they should be. I'm guessing most of us know about the gender pay gap at this point. Uh, Carta did a really good study a couple years ago called the equity gender gap. And yeah, female CEOs hold way less equity in their own startups than their male CEO counterparts. Um, and so it is, again, many problems to be fixed. What about some stories to uh, tell? Anything come to mind, King, off of what Angela just said? Jody, to you? Well, one thing I can say is that um, there's different models out there now to secure capital. So for instance, if you're um, a, someone who has a donor advice fund where capital just sits, you're making maybe a little bit of interest on it, it's a nonprofit structure, you can take that capital now and invest it in a company, uh, any kind of company, through a structure that Lojas Advisors can set up for you. When there's a profitable event, those profits can go back into the donor advice fund without a tax taxation. And so I like some of, some of these alternative uh, models, and I think that we should become inventive and creative around how we're going to uh, going out going about. Of finding capital. What are the names of some of those, and how does one find their way to that? Well, uh, so Lojas Advisors is a great group. Uh, Rick Davis runs this group, and it's um, uh, that's what they do. They set up these structures for donor advised funds. And some of them now, like Impact Assets, yeah. um, if you if you put money there, they you can inv you can actually have some of it invested into funds. Um, and then Astia's structure is unique because our over our overreaching organization, Astia, is a 501c3, and then we have the venture fund under it. So we can take funding either way. We can take donations and funnel those into the fund, in which case the donor doesn't get them back, but it still is going into sort of this gender investments or the traditional um, venture fund investments. But there are more of those kinds of structures coming out too. I mean, one of the things I want to say is to inspire men you know who have capital to make it their business to fund more women. You know, just that direct thing. So at Women Funding the World, we have women come from 6.30 to 8.30, and we dive deep, like what are we doing? What do we need? Like what is our legacy with our capital? And then we invite the guys to come from 8.30 on, and we ask them not to pitch their deal so much, but to instead open doors for women, so. Pretty cool, don't you think? So uh, I invented this very smarmy uh, 
an overview that I do, five stupid things that entrepreneurs do all the time. And so we're not left out. I also include five stupid things that investors do all the time. And I'm quick to say I've done every one of those things. Because it's important for entrepreneurs to know what are you getting from the investor? How should they behave? You know, And there's a wide variety of stupid behavior. Uh, so, but one of the number one stupid things that especially women do, when men do it, it's just not as glaring, is around the numbers and the financials. So I love to say, hey, if I ask you what your pre-money valuation was on the last round and I get a blank look, guess what? You might have gotten this meeting, you're not going to get the next meeting. I want you to be financially savvy. And I love sharing. It's not algebra, geometry, or calculus. It is simple multiplication, division, subtraction. And it's learnable because there's so much information on the web, as well as AI. You can actually present the algorithm, so to speak, to an AI, simple AI, free AI, and, and get to where you want to go. This kind of knowledge is critical for success. What would you add to those kinds of silly things I'm talking about? This isn't necessarily a silly thing, but I think it's important to remind everyone that venture capital is not the right fit for many, many businesses. And so if you are doing a business that um, is not going to be in that high growth model, there are other types of capital to go after and, and you know look for those and be open to those. It's hard for artistic endeavors or things that involve community or you know things that are kind of take some real hands-on work um, to get venture capital because that needs that needs you know really big margins and and scalability, scalability and ability to you know really get those big big returns so don't necessarily go after but venture capital is stay, what I would stay, say. Victoria, especially since you ran an angel fund for so long, stay on that. What is the suggestion then around high net worth or angel investors? How to even find that angel? I, that's what people ask me all the time. And so you speak to that, if you would, about finding your way. So in terms of if you're a founder looking for funding, yeah, where, where would I go? Without, not without venture. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the I would say probably... The, if you want to know angel networks, there's the Angel Capital Association. They're kind of an umbrella organization to know the local angel network. That's one. Um, the second thing I would say is to, um, if you go, uh, if you, uh, I'm trying to remember the actual exact URL. If you go to 37angels.com forward slash accelerators, we have all the accelerators listed by sector and geography. And accelerators are basically school for startups. They're also these great hubs that connect founders and investors. And so if you're like, I really love education technology startups. Well, then you go to startedcom and they are a really great ed tech accelerator. And then in one afternoon, you can meet all the best ed tech investors and all the best ed tech startups. And I, that would probably actually be my first yeah. place, maybe even before angel investing, is just to start hearing some pitches and understanding that vernacular. Um, that was probably where I would, those two places are where I would start. Here, here's the aha moment I love to create. Somebody, that just happens all the time. I need funding. I don't know anybody to go to. I sit them down. I say, you have to write down everybody you know, people you worked with, people you work for, people who worked for you, your next door neighbor. Now, this is very controversial. I don't actually believe, you know how they say friends and family? I don't believe in family. Guess why? You got to talk to them at Thanksgiving. And <laughs> they have to, they're going to ask you. Uh, I somewhat ingest. Uh, so many families have helped people promote companies till they get somewhere. but. I create the aha moment by reminding them, you don't even have to say your name. They know what you can do. They appreciate you. And guess what? Call them in for pizza and beer or meet them for breakfast and tell your story and ask, I am looking for $50,000. Would you be willing to join me and help me build this? Guess what? Might just get that. Well, and it's crazy because the men do that all the time. All the time. Right? I mean, I'll never forget my husband came home one day and he had invested in some, I don't know, some colleague doing this startup and he just, and I was like, wait, what? Did you do diligence? Did you, what? Did you, no. did you see a deck? Did you, no. It just was like, oh yeah, all the other people were, you know, all the other people in my office were investing, so la la la. That's what guys do. Yeah. What, what Since they're five years old, they've been doing this. That's part of the networking issue. Yeah. Jody. One of the things I was going to say is that I really think it's important if you're out here as an entrepreneur 
to really be truthful in yourself. Do you have something innovative and sticky? Do you have something that's breakthrough? Have you thought about your, have you done your competitive analysis so that you can really find your lane? And most importantly, are you out there as the visionary? Are you like your voice behind the brand? Are you, or are you hiding behind the name of the brand or things like that? So, you know, investors love stickiness. They love um, uh, an energetic quality that you know what you're doing, you're out there, you're innovative, and get on the train because it's taking off. So it's one piece of advice. Totally agree. And just speaking of networks, you know, women are so great at building networks, but we're not often as good at leveraging them. Um, and I, I think it's really important to differentiate between mentorship and sponsorship. And women, again, I get, I don't know, 20 emails a week for people wanting to take me to coffee or whatever. Um, and then, but over and over again, the emails I get from women are like, I want to pick your brain, I want to ask you for advice. And the emails I get from men are, introduce me to these five people, yeah. <laughs> right? And I, I'm not saying you need to be, I mean, I would say, yeah, be that forward, right? So make it really easy, ask for help, and make it really easy for people to help you. All of you, I promise, are connected, if not first degree, second degree, to 100 angel investors, right? And so go on LinkedIn and just find people who are angel investors in your network, and I promise you, you know people who are either they're in your first degree connections or they're second degree, and then email them and be like, hey, you know these four angel investors, would you introduce me? And then write a blurb about how awesome you are so that they can forward it on. And again, I get that email over and over again on a daily basis from men, but much less so from women. I'm like, you don't want my advice. You want money. Tell me you want money. I also believe in the earliest days in getting your board of advisors, friends that you, or, or not, that you know that can contribute, call them together by Zoom or in person. Because guess what? If an investor angel comes in, that's the first group they could call. Is she any good at what she does? Does she have vision? Is she organized? Does she know what she's doing? What do you think of the business? So that is a really, and very few people take, you know, know to do that. Now, dare we take a few questions? Because this is Ask Us Anything. Okay, this is Ask Us Anything. Um, Speak up. Yeah, I mean, I think the first question is, is this philanthropy, right, or is it an investment? So I think that's, and I, I, I would make those decisions differently, but let's say this is an investment. Um, actually, if you go to 37angels.com forward slash download, we have a one-page overview of our investment framework. So it's 37angels.com forward slash download. But again, it's what do you look for in people, what do you look for in problem, um, uh, price and progress. But I guess the short answer is, are you going to get your money back? And so you have to make sure that the founder wants to exit. I think that is one, one thing that's really important. Um, there are only two ways for a startup to exit. One is the IPO, which only happens usually a couple hundred times a year, or they get acquired. Um, and if they want to run this company for the next 30 years of their life and pass it on to their children, their grandchildren, then we as investors actually can't invest because we'll never get our money back. Um, but that's my kind of short answer to that question. But uh, Angela, I think one of part of her question might also be how much money. So what are Sorry. your investment sizes? That was my question because yeah. I didn't think about getting my money back. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Most of the time. Yeah. 
So what most founders will say is they won't take an individual check for less than $25,000. That's usually kind of the floor. Some founders will take make exceptions and go maybe down to like $10,000 or, or whatever the case may be. Um, that's as an individual direct check. However, if you want to make a smaller investment, you can go into equity crowdfunding sites. Mm -hmm. Equity crowdfunding sites allow you to put $1,000 into a company $50 into a company. So we funder Seed Invest. So I would say if you're doing angel investing, you're talking directly to a founder and giving them a check. $25,000 is the number I would keep in mind. But you can go smaller through equity crowdfunding. And then the thing I would add is if you're going to angel invest, it is hi, you know, highly risky asset class. So you need a diversified portfolio. Thank so you, you need at least 10 investments. I would say probably 20. But at least 10. Not in year one. You, know, you can spread it out over the next 5, 10 years but then do that calculus. So if you're ready to set aside that amount of money over the next five, 10 years and build out that portfolio, then it's a great thing to do. And you know, some of it will you will absolutely lose, but then you also have the potential upside where you get these huge outsized return from one or two. Um, so hopefully, I hopefully you know I just got the hook. So let's quickly go down the line with any words of wisdom. Ange Angela, you start. That's right. Jody, start? Okay. Start. Jody, you go. Words of wisdom. Step into your power. Ask big, like uh, more than you think you should ask for, and ask men to open doors to capital. Um, for anybody who can invest, put your money to work. Um, you can also invest in funds, and they are automatically diversified, so Astia, um, <laughs> or any other funds. Um, join an angel group, um, then you have people to learn with, and some angel groups pool money so that you, maybe you can do even a, a little bit smaller check. Um, but definitely get out there and invest and, and tell others in your network to invest as well. Lean into imposter syndrome. And I have been Sorry, lucky. Lean into imposter syndrome. Is what I said. I've been lucky to be part of because I was a fund manager several times. Over 150 investments, both tech, life sciences, and cannabis, which is a fascinating area. Uh, very scary and crazy right now. But but 100 billion dollars over the next few years, and so we only invested when I thought that CEO knew what to do and how to do it. You're not born knowing that, so get people around you, pull them to your side, and they can help figure it out with you. And thank you so much for engaging and thank being you. part of it.